Okay, so we've spent a lot of time talking about inventories and what we know. And yesterday we focused quite a bit on what we don't know, which is to say the gaps. And we really started talking about gaps in a spatial sense. Essentially, what is the biggest hole on a map? What's the largest region that has not seen sampling? And Arturo talked about some other gaps, taxonomic gaps and temporal gaps. And I think all of those are very kind of easy to think about. Um, you know, it's very easy to say, okay, in the decade of the 40s, we didn't have any sampling because of X. Um, and when you think about gaps on a map, it's quite easy because you're looking at the points and you're, you're seeing the biggest area that doesn't have points or that has very few points. There's another kind of gap <laughs> that is, let's say, a little bit harder to visualize, and that is gaps in environmental coverage. So you can think about this and it will all of a sudden be obvious to you, okay? Um, for example, our roads never go over mountaintops, right? And we've already seen in a bunch of maps the phenomenon of the lazy botanist, right? Where all the points are along the roads. And so right away you're thinking, hmm, do those peaks get sampled? And so that's, that's a very easy way to think about, you know, for example, in Mexico, where I've moved around the country over the last 25 years or so, I don't think anybody's been up to truly alpine habitats working with birds in recent memory. We're always working at middle elevation. Or on the other hand, um, one of the projects or one of the analyses that was done in the <coughs> course in Ghana was a Ghanaian herpetologist. And he was looking at sampling of uh, Ghana elevationally. And what he found there was that the highest elevations in Ghana were hugely oversampled. And that's because amphibians show quite a bit of richness and endemism on the highest peak in the country. And so apparently all the herpetologists go there because it's where the really neat stuff is. And so it, it varies between a question of ac access or pleasantness or interest. But we certainly focus our activities in certain habitats and not in certain other habitats, okay? And that's essentially what turns into these biases that we call gaps in environmental space. So when we were talking about geographic gaps, we were looking at a map like this, okay? It didn't have any environment on it. It was just really the only thing you get off of this map is the political boundaries and distances, okay? Ghana and, and Togo are very close to one another, and Ghana and Ethiopia are very distant from one another. But that's really the, the only information you're seeing on this map. So, without a doubt, geographic distance is related to change in faunas, and Arturo will be talking about that later in the week, which is to say, if you move that direction, of the set of species that's right here, they're gonna start to drop out, <coughs> okay? And so if we see a huge gap in the middle of our map, and maybe there's no sampling in all that space, we know that faunas and floras will change. Okay, that's obvious. So distant sites are likely to have different communities. 
But we also know that environmental characteristics play a really important role in setting limits to species distributions. And that's really the subject of a whole different course. Um, and in fact, it's been the subject of a little bit too much of my life with uh, what's called ecological niche modeling. There's a book that we published a few years ago. Um, and that was the subject of a course that we did in Nairobi that a couple of you were, were present at. And essentially the idea is the fundamental or senopoetic or Grinnellian ecological niche is the set of environmental conditions under which a species can maintain populations without immigrational subsidy. So we're talking about some set of conditions that are right for the species and all conditions outside of that set, the species either can't live there, can't survive there, or can't maintain populations there. And so the ecological niche provides one important uh, determinant on geographic <coughs> distributions. So we could look at a different kind of map that tells us something about environment. Okay? And essentially what I'm saying is that some distances, let's imagine this distance, that distance kind of stays in the same conditions. But that same distance there, or there, or there, makes a huge difference. Okay? So we have geographic distance, and we know that in some way relates to turnover in species. But then we have environmental difference that also is playing a role. And so we really have to start sorting out these two sets of influences. In the context of this course, when we talk about gaps, we're talking about where should we survey to maximize the utility of our results. You know, if we're talking about wild crop relatives, well, the most different stocks may be either far away geographically or they may be under different environmental conditions. Or if we're searching for uh, full documentation of the plants of the Cameroon Mountains, the most interesting peaks may be the ones that are farthest away or maybe the ones that are most different, drier, wetter, than the ones that have been sampled. So that's essentially what we're, what we're after with this. We need to start parsing environmental difference from geographic difference. So difference in faunas and floras and difference in environments generally accumulate with geographic distance, but the accumulation is not linear and it's not even absolute. Sometimes you go a far distance away geographically and you're in a very similar environmental circumstance. Okay? And in other cases, you go a short geographic distance and the environments change dramatically. So montane regions, um, places where wind currents or um, weather patterns change drastically, um, so again, these are two separate things. And what we're really setting out to do is to evaluate gaps separately, okay, independently in terms of these two things. This is uh, work from one of my doctoral students who finished up last year. He's interested in a, a mistletoe that uh, occurs in the southwestern US and northwestern Mexico. And essentially what he did was he sampled essentially all of those points that you can see. Um, a lot of his sampling was driving down small roads. One person's driving and the other person is going like this on a GPS machine. Yes, 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 yes. And so I think it was 26,000 <laughs> points in all. But essentially all I want you to see is that the, the topology of these spaces is very different. For each of these points, my student 
put together a view of the geographic range center and the centroid of the niche. And all I want you to see is that these two clouds have very different shapes, okay? And so, again, you're gonna get some sort of linear relationship, but it's not going to be very linear. So this is now back to Africa, Gulf of Guinea, and you can see Bioko Island there. And all I want you to see is, imagine one distance, and in some places, this is in terms of land cover, and this is annual mean precipitation. In some places, that distance doesn't make much of a difference of environment. And in other places, it makes a huge difference. So when we evaluate gaps in your inventories, what we are seeing may be very small spatially when we talk about environments, but it may have a very different set of conditions. Uganda is a great example. Think about montane habitats in this country. Okay? You could survey 90% of the surface of this country and not get to those alpine habitats that are along the western border. But if you wanted to know all the species or get at the full diversity or know all the endemics in this country, you know you have to get up to those alpine habitats. So imagine that we could rewrite the biodiversity history of, of Uganda and instead of having all of the sampling being done wherever uh, scientists could go, what if we could just throw random points on the country? Imagine being able to do that. But if we did that, those random points might miss those alpine habitats entirely. Okay? So, random spatially, or even not very gappy spatially, a nice even grid across the country, may miss the environments. So if we could rewind our sampling of Ugandan biodiversity, and if we had all the money in the world and all the people and all the specialists that we need, we wouldn't want to do just a uniform grid, or we wouldn't want to do a random sampling. Rather, we'd want to cover space and cover environments. Okay, so that's essentially what we're talking about today. And so what we'll do with the rest of the lectures today, which is basically Lindsay, um, is that we will go through how do you visualize and how do you explore environmental spaces that are associated with a region. Okay? Any questions about the overview? Going once, going twice. Okay. Up, oh, Jean. Uh, don't worry. In in sampling techniques, usually mm -hmm. we talk about the stratification mm -hmm. that is taken into account with variation uh, of environment and over variable. <coughs> to be able to sample with a given level of representation. Mm -hmm. Is it also useful? Very much so. So you can stratify spatially, and that would be either uh, some sort of random within subsets of your region, and then you can also stratify environmentally. So for example, you could take uh, precipitation regimes, divide them into four bins, and make sure that your sampling is evenly distributed across those bins even though you know, the very driest parts of Benin may be smaller, or the very wettest parts of Benin may be smaller, but you would do more points in there so that you are representing those environments. Now, the more dimensions you stratify by, either the more points or the less detail. So you know, if you have four bins for precipitation, and four bins for elevation. Now we have 16 bins. 
Okay, so obviously the sampling requirements start to go up quite a bit. But yeah, stratified sampling is essentially the way that we would ideally design our new surveys of a region if we could do that. Okay?